Rucka. As time passed, Plato's influence increased. Philo brought him to the Jews. Enter Christianity. Augustine cemented Plato to the West and written pages. Place of faith over reason, bringing in the dark age. Yeah, we're live. Welcome to Black Sheep Theology. My name is Drew, and with us today we have over here on my left... Chris Fisher of God is Open. <laughs> and and below me, down here, we have Jordan of Not a, Not a Tame Sheep Podcast. So today, we are talking about... Does Neoplatonism have or has had an influence on Christianity, Neoplatonism, Platonism today. And so Chris is going to be like our expert today on all of this, and he's going to talk us through this. So you crack us off, Chris. What are we What are we talking about today? Okay, so the idea is that some people in this world, they claim, hey, this is a ridiculous concept that Christianity has been influenced by Platonism or Neoplatonism, whatever flavor you, you want to throw out there. But uh, the idea is that, uh, yeah, has Christianity been influenced by Platonism? Nietzsche famously stated that Christianity is Platonism for the people. What did he mean by that? Was he correct? What is he talking about? And so I do got a couple clips that we are going to be showing today. And we're going to show one from a Yale professor, Christine Hayes, who's an Old Testament expert. And uh, her lectures are actually pretty good at just understanding the Bible. So maybe like if you're like a little kid, you start out with what's in the Bible, and then you get like a little older, then you just go on to uh, introduction to uh, the Hebrew Bible, Yale University courses. But let me pull up our screen and uh, we'll listen to her talk about that. Christine Hayes on the Platonistic influence on Christianity. All right, Christine Hayes, tell us all about it. I think one of the things I encounter so much in my teaching, um, when I teach a Bible course, my, the, the introduction to the Hebrew Bible, um, students will say to me, this makes no sense. God doesn't act this way. God is omniscient. Why does he need to go down to investigate complaints on earth? God is omnipotent. Why can't he do what he wants to do? Why is he thwarted? Why couldn't he create humans so that they wouldn't have sinned in the garden? Um, God never changes his mind. God is one and the same. So how can Exodus 32 verse 14 say by Yinachem Hashem that God changes his mind? Um, and what I remind students is that um, that image of God is really um, an outcome of a certain Western philosophical tradition that's grounded very much in Greco-Roman notions of the divine as that which is static, um, immutable, unchanging uh, truth. And that those notions really come from a different cultural concept and a different kind of conversation. Um, God is the unmoved mover, um, and a one in which perfection is understood to be stasis, unchanging, static reality. Um, and that is not the God that we meet in biblical and Jewish tradition. The God that we meet in biblical tradition is a dynamic God. This is a God who um, is intimately involved in creation um, and interacting with creation, learning um, about the creatures that he has created, um, changing course in response to their actions and their reactions to his actions. So um, to my mind, this is in fact the traditional um, notion of God, um, but unfortunately, we sometimes wear a set of lenses that have been handed to us through the Western philosophical tradition coming out of the Greco-Roman um, philosophical tradition, which speaks of the divine in very different ways. And we sometimes then read biblical stories or midrashim and are, are sort of shocked or scandalized by what we see there. You know, how could they describe God in this way? Isn't God weak or uh, doesn't, doesn't this impugn God's authority and divinity? to see him as, um, you know, as, as being someone who negotiates or who could be talked out of things or who adjusts himself. And, and I think not. I think that for the Bible and for the rabbis, what's divine about God is precisely not that he's static, that which is static is dead, but precisely that he's dynamic and alive and interacting with humans and very much in need of their input so that he can make the necessary adjustments to be the kind of God uh, and ruler and, and king and father and friend and partner that they need. Uh, he needs good um, 
sparring partners. I like the phrase sparring partner because it captures the idea both of partnership, but also of challenge and, and, and being an adversary sometimes. So God needs sparring partners. Yeah. So one of the top five books I would recommend for reading for Christianity is uh, Pious Irreverence by Dov Weiss, in which he talks about this concept that's reoccurring through ancient Talmudic literature and the Bible of God and his interactions with people who press back against God. A God is a God who invites interaction, invites input. You see God making decisions not based on what God thinks is best, but he makes decisions on behalf of people who are praying for things, which is that's that's not, not a, like a Calvinist concept. And the Calvinist concept is like, oh, God's going to answer our prayers in the ways that are best for maximizing good in the universe, something like that. But often in the Bible, we see the exact opposite, that someone wants something and uh, God prioritizes their wants over his own. God throughout the Bible is a relational God, a God that's interested in creation, who who cares about watching who we are, what we're doing, takes a keen interest in, in our uh, apostasy or even our worship. God cares when we pray to him. God sings over us. King David's able to negotiate with God. God, if I die, there's going to be nobody to worship you, God. You're going to be foregoing my praise, which is something you value. You value this interaction. God is intensely personal within the Bible. And this is the biblical picture that Christine Hayes is, is setting up in contrast to a static view, a static view in which God doesn't change. He doesn't have thought processes. He's uh, he he's he's in this other category, and this is what we're going to be talking about tonight, uh, in reference to Platonism. We're not going to be talking about the other elements of Platonism, other than their conception of the divine. Drew, yeah, I think that um, I really, I mean, so I think people's main pushback, at least for me, if I was skeptical of this on. Christine Hayes is specifically that she's not a Christian, right? And so then she doesn't have the, you know, sort of special kind of perspective that we might have. Um, but I, I did, in light of some things that I've been thinking about recently on the subject, I did think how she highlighted the personal relationship aspect of um, God in scriptures and how he's related, uh, he relates to us. And she used the word dynamic quite a bit. And... Um, yeah, I think that's really interesting. I mean, I'm pretty new, I guess, to all of this. I'm I'm vaguely familiar with some of the claims of Neoplatonism, Platonism, classical theism, and stuff like that. But um, yeah, those are just some initial thoughts. Yeah, and of course, we would never say believe someone just because they have a PhD right after their name. But just today, I've been dealing with a whole host of Michael Heiser advocates or something like that, where. Uh, Michael Heiser's advocating some sort of middle knowledge, and his proof text is David and Saul, how God says, hey, if you stay here, Saul's going to come, and the people of Kayla are going to turn you over. And Michael Heiser says, see, this is middle knowledge. God has all knowledge of all futures, actualities, and possibilities. It's like, that's a fallacy of composition, and you got just dozens of people just mimicking this just saying the same things just because someone they value has said this it's like they're, they're not doing independent thought towards that so uh, it's important to understand what the scholars say but it's even more important to look at their evidence why they're saying what they're saying their evidence should be able to speak for their views there they might have a good summary but we should be rational actors jordan we haven't heard you in a while why don't you give some input what's your thoughts on that um, man, <laughs> well, the, the Heiser thing, that passage isn't, um, that isn't proof of middle knowledge because <clears throat> in middle knowledge, it would be between what God knows could be and what God knows will be is what would be. And the citizens of Kela did not turn David over to Saul. So God wouldn't have told David that they will do that because he didn't actualize a world in which they will do that. 
So that's not middle knowledge. It's, um, I don't know if you've read Tim Stratton's book, but he just changes the verse from will to would. <laughs> so he says, God tells David, if you stay here, this is what they would do. And I'm like, now what the verse says. But that's that's what middle knowledge is, that you know be, between what could be and will be what would be. God would have said to David, if you stay here, they would. But that's not what he said. He said, yeah, I guess I guess what the the argument there is that if um, if you stay here, then they will. So it's kind of inferred to be a would like they they would do this if you were here. But since you're not going to be here, they will not. So that's the difference between the would and will. But you're right that it doesn't say specifically would. And um, I mean, we're also talking about agents that are existing that have current thoughts and motivations and plans and stuff like that. So, yeah, the, the proof texts for, for middle knowledge are, are, I mean, I think it's kind of unnecessary, really, because middle knowledge is, a, is an affirmation of the immutable pre-creation divine decree, which I don't know, Chris, like, is so would Neoplatonism and Neoplatonism and Platonism necessitate the divine decree? Like, is that standard for play? So in Neoplatonism, God doesn't have agency. The world is a reflection. It's created as a reflection unto God. Whereas in standard Calvinist theology, the world is created not to give God anything, not to enhance God whatsoever, but to reflect his greatest glory so they will assign more active agency to God, even though they don't believe in agency. We'll actually go over that. We're, we, I got pulled up a book uh, by Norman Geisler against open theism called God Made in the Image of Man, which he talks about this. God has no potentiality to be other than he is. He's pure actuality. But they'll still try to attribute some sort of like divine decree, which would not be in normal Neoplatonism. But and re, just, just keep in mind, though, that Plotinus... Within his Eneads, he's actively sparring with the Gnostics about, about philosophy. Like the, these are his people who he interacts with and argues these finer points with. Why? Because they're basically in the same system that they could have these, these intra disputes about this. That they are they are the Gnostics. The Platonists are the Gnostics. They're, they're the same people who could have these discussions and argue among themselves about these finer points. But to your point that Christine Hayes is an atheist, we do have pulled up um, a non-open theist, David Hunt, and I did get clarification that it's not the David Hunt that looks exactly like him that wrote some sort of four views book. This is a philosophical David Hunt non-open theist. This is not this is not the Dave Hunt that wrote on simple foreknowledge in the four views book. Right, they look the same. There's two David wow. Hunts. <laughs> they both write against open theism. And they both look the same, but this is a different David Hunt. Well, I don't know how. The, there was a come David on, guys, wrote, change your name, uh, change your name. He wrote, "What love is this?" Is, I don't think it's this guy. That's a different Dave Hunt. Okay, I, I think so. Yeah, that's that's the Dave Hunt that's passed away. I thought this was the Dave Hunt of the four views of divine foreknowledge and stuff. I read, oh, okay. yeah, I read that book in his chapter and it was, I had to read it four or five times to even understand what he was saying. I'm just not a like a philosophically minded type person and he's real heavy into philosophy, but we'll, we'll hear what he has to say. Yeah, we'll, we'll hear what he has to say. So you don't have to take Christine Hayes' words for it. Here's non-open theist, possible Calvinist, David Hunt. And I actually care a lot about, about the tradition. Um, I think it's a little intellectually arrogant not to care uh, about it. Um, and um, openness will, uh, it, there's no doubt that the, the tradition was influenced by, by pagan philosophy, in particular Neoplatonism. Uh, you can't read Augustine's Confessions, for example, without, uh, uh, without you know, realizing that. Um, and openness will often that the, that the tradition was corrupted by pagan philosophy. Whether it amounts to corruption, of course, depends on whether, whether it was a beneficent influence or, uh, or a bad influence. I tend to think, uh, uh, as a Neoplatonist myself, 
<laughs> I tend to think that it was a beneficent pittance one. All right, so there, there he says. There's no doubt that there's been influence. It's he's, it's it's basically accepted fact. Christianity wasn't the only. <clears throat> it's basically a, a accepted fact in a lot of Christian circles that this influence does exist and and secular fields. The only people who seem to be denying this is a subset of evangelicals who seem to have some sort of skin in the game. It, it almost seems like they they just want it to be true that there's not this influence because that fundamentally undermines their worldview. Well, I so I have a question maybe before we go into the next thing. So um, he's talk, he's talked about the the phrase openness, which is like code, I guess, for open theists and people who hold to like a partially open future or that the future is not exhaustively settled and so on. Um, now, I guess for the for the uh, for the non openist non sort of neoplatonist Christian, what would you say to them as far as like why they should not believe not believe in neoplatonist Christianity if that makes any sense? Well, categorically, I don't think Platonism is rational. It uh, it, it takes us metaphysics and it's like what is the best thing to exist and then it it's like people sitting around trying to conceptualize what's the highest value deity that they could come up with and it's an arbitrary system of values and so they'll do things like well if something can change it has to change for the better or the worst and um if god is maximally great and there's a change he can't change for the better so the change is going to have to be for the worse Therefore, the maximally great being cannot change because that would mean he's not maximally great. And from that, we could understand that uh, he can't have any potentiality to be something different. So it, they'll, they'll drive. It a sounds like it's values. very. It sounds like it's very deductive. Like you start with a concept of God is perfect, and then you deduce from there, eliminating a lot of different possibilities as far as uh, what you're allowed to to affirm if you affirm that God is perfect. And then, and, and then there's and the whole question of, of what that even means, God is perfect. Right? It's so amazingly subjective. So I went to the randomness conference, I don't know how many years ago, but I went with Will Duffy. And the entire randomness conference was open theists, Arminians, Calvinists. And every single lecture was about them throwing formulas that like literally some some guy put like a big formula on the screen and he said oh i figured it out this is the for god formula or something like that they're all trying to figure out their subjective formulas to to decide what the maximally great being was and they're arguing among themselves Be, it, the, the problem is that maximally great being is subjective just inherently and so the platonistic value system is not intuitive it's not objective it's just something somebody made up and now everyone's subjectively arguing with about it and they have all their different conclusions because really there, there's no standards. It's whatever standard that they decide to come up with that they think is great. Oh yeah, uh, God with one hat's not as great as a God with two hats. So God with two hats is better. It's, it's just, they're just making things up. So I, I do got pulled up um, Plato. If you, if you could turn to Plato and you turn to Paramendes, you could see the formation of his concept of deity, the one, the summum bonum, the ultimate good, uh, simplicity. And uh, I got uh, this, I got pulled up on the screen excerpts from my draft book about the, the Hellenization of Christianity. And I go through, uh, I wonder if I could pull up the table of contents on this so that everyone could see kind of like uh, what headings there are. I go through Tactus, uh, Juvenal, Septuagint, Jubilees, uh, Maccabees, Dead Sea Scrolls, things like that. So it's it's trying to be pretty exhaustive. But uh, this scholar that I found comments on Platonism. There's a debate in Platonist circles. How close is Neoplatonism to Platonism? And he points out that this Paramendes work by Plato is a pretty solid evidence that Neoplatonism is really not that far off from just normal Platonism. He says, of all the dialogues of Plato, none proved a more obstinate obstacle to all the denials of essential similarity between Platonism and Neoplatonism 
than did Paramendes. Time and time again, the Neoplatonic interpretation of that dialogue found its champions regardless of the general trend of viewing all such attempts with suspicion. And so, of course, the Neoplatonists at the time of Plotinus, which is around the 3rd century AD, they wouldn't say, oh, we're Neoplatonists. They're, they're just going to say we're Pla Platonists. We, we, we're looking at what Plato says, we're interpreting what Plato says, and we're trying to do it accurately and true. Yeah, Plato is their Bible. Uh, they're, they're not contradicting Plato. They're using Plato to drive their system. And so here's Plato and him talking about the one, which... It looks exactly like the God that Augustine is worshiping eventually. He says, if the one is, the one cannot be many. The one cannot have parts, cannot be a whole because every part is part of a whole. So let's, let's think about this a little bit. So we already talked about this change ultimatum, which you're going to find in Plato's The Republic, that which changes, always changes for the worse. And so if you, you change if you have parts. So let's say there's two parts to something. Those parts can be different in relation to each other. Like one part could be over here, one part could be over here, and then they could shift. There's reasons they're parts. There's distinctions, and those distinctions make differences, and those differences uh, invoke uh, an ability to change. Therefore, the one actually can't have these parts. It has to be something called simple. And if you're familiar with any Christian systematic theology, uh, simpl divine simplicity is one of the most highly championed values. It's, it's, it's one that Calvinists don't quite know of. A lot of Christians, Christians in general, don't know of it. But even Calvinists, they don't know their own systematic theology. I always give the example where on a Calvinist page, I put a poll, do you affirm divine simplicity? Over 100 votes and like half the people never heard of it. But it's, it's part of their metaphysics. God has no parts because parts invoke change and degradation and it, it creates a it, it means that not all that's in god is god god has to be all one divine simple substance because if there's distinction then that's non-god substance you just created two substances it has to be pure simplicity he says and what or did you want to have a comment well, i was just going to say what so what is the difference between so you've got, because um, from what I understand, classical theism more or less entails divine simplicity, but then Neoplatonism and Platonism also have divine simplicity. So what would people say is the main difference between the two? Like if you were to kind of steel man what they're saying the difference is, because to me, I'm like, why? Well, first of all, why believe any of this? And then second of all, why are we even making a distinction? Like, I'm just not, um, what would you, what would they say? They're not going to say there's a difference between the two because they both need this divine simplicity where God is pure substance and that substance is undivided and indivisible. That's why we have a concept called the hypostatic union in which God exists in different hypostases. And uh, people like James White, they'll block me on Twitter for asking the question, was the human part of Jesus God? Why? Because they actually affirm divine simplicity and the God substance can't actually have parts. So the human part of Jesus can't be God. And so if they do answer, they'll typically say, oh, you just don't understand the hypostatic union. Well, I, I do. I, I understand it better than you. There's a reason you're afraid of this question is because it you understand that you have to answer in the negative that the human part of Jesus can't be the God part because that introduces parts. And so if anyone wants to just see this affirmation and process, uh, just go uh, download by, buy any James Dolezal books. He has one on divine simplicity. He has one on the famous maxim, all that is in God is God. Both of those books are great books. And both of those books affirm this classical simplicity, the, these classical formulations. And he talks about the history and why it's the case and why these things have to be true. He's adopting a Platonistic framework. The, the, these are his arguments that he's making, arguments originally made by Plato, picked up by people like Plotinus, and argued and championed by people like Augustine. Augustine said that the divine voice saying, this is my son, it cannot be God, why can it not be God? Because those are words in time. and Words have sequence. And that, of course, creates parts. And so instead of this is my son, who I love, it, that has to be God 
pre-programming a divine creature to mimic those words in history rather than God speaking in a tensed form. God, God can't be tensed. God can't be interacting with time. That creates degradation. And so th there is no difference between these views. They are the same view. I guess that's one thing that I've never understood about all of this uh, regarding the, you know, pure actuality, which maybe you'll go on to talk a little bit about. I'm not sure how all this different stuff wraps together, but pure actuality versus potentiality and how that like th it just seems like there are these ideas where um, and Dave Hunt talks about this, where he basically says that he thinks it's arrogant to sort of dismiss this robust tradition of um you know divine simplicity uh, basically you know these these kind of neoplatonic thoughts in christianity to which i mean and maybe this is kind of arrogant of me and maybe it's why i believe what i believe instead of something different but i'm just like i don't care i just i don't see this i don't see this in the scriptures so i just don't see any reason why to defend it and and when you ha have these beliefs you end up having to explain from my perspective, a way a lot of scriptures as opposed to, um, and I guess this is maybe this is what we'll get into here with the gods of satiety. We just recently went through a study in Malachi, um, where I think it's in chapter three, verse 10, where he says, um, because I do not change, you are not destroyed Israel. And then it's, and then that turns into this metaphysical perfection, no change whatsoever. When all he's saying is like, because I'm faithful to my promises, I'm not destroying you because if I wasn't faithful, then I would just say, forget you guys. I'm going to destroy you, get rid of you and forget about this whole plan. Um, so it is. Okay. So here's an analogy and then I'll turn it over to Jordan for some comment too, because we need him in, involved. Um, Economics, econ. You could go go to college. You could take econ one one. You could learn fundamentally how supply and demand works. Uh, you could learn about the curves and, and uh, how supply shifts and demand shifts affect prices. But then you get into macroeconomics, and now you have all sorts of people competing and introducing weird models. Uh, they'll they'll go gather data. A lot of the data is. Uh, you can't replicate. A lot of these studies are non-replicatable and it's uh, post hoc studies where they, they kind of build the model to fit the data to get their points. And so you have this big debate in macroeconomics about these various obscure models, right? And so what what's happening there is that people engage in this, this hubris where they think that, you know, the, the microeconomics is not good enough. Uh, let's build these complicated models to highlight our intelligence and to uh, basically peacock for the world or or uh, gain some status in this field. But all the models, they're they're just they're 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 not good models. And you get a lot of inbreeding going on in these colleges in which everyone's repeating these same models and they're arguing over nuances in these models. It's it's almost a self-destructive field. You, you get the same thing going on in theology. They, they found something to argue over their models that they could bounce off against each other. It's, it's just something to fight about that just, and, and to strive for status. It's not found in the Bible, but it's, it's their little niche that they could, they could uh, latch onto build their careers around their lives around to demonstrate intelligence. It's not, it's not real, right? It's, I, I'm with you on that. Jordan, your thoughts. <laughs> Well, let me say about eight things. Um, so this is G.K. Chesterton. Jordan's like, <gasps> um, yeah, <laughs> this is G.K. Chesterton. Um, so more proof um, that Platonism influenced Christianity. Uh, this is his book on Aquinas. He says, St. Thomas, for all his love of Greek philosophy, saved us from being Platonists. And that's because... Augustine was a Platonist, as you have pointed out. So like when you played, you know, the video of that lady talking at the beginning, the um, the one talking about the Hebrew Bible, I'm like, she's arguing against something. And I'm like, yeah, that's what Augustine taught. That's wrong. And then she argues for something. I'm like, okay, that's okay. And then she says some things and I'm like, oh boy, <laughs> not with you on that one. So um, 
there is a difference between saying that God is open and saying that the future is open. So like Aquinas affirmed that the future is open. He argued quite extensively that the future is open. Um, and what do you think is the difference between saying God is open and the future is open? Well, because um, to say that God is open as I understand it. Well, yeah, let me get to that in just a second. So here's my understanding and my framework through which I view all of this stuff. My understanding is what you're reading of, and I've always heard it pronounced Parmenides, um, is that Parmenides was making an argument against the existence of God. So what he was saying was there is only being and non-being. And if anything has being, it has to be part of the one because it, it has being. It's, it's like you have to read it or read somebody that can um, summarize it well. But what Parmenides taught or Parmenides taught is still believed today. Like Deepak Chopra is an absolute pantheist. And he believes in monism, which is what Parmenides was teaching. And um, the atheists like Sam Harris and, um, man, I always forget their names. Um, who's the uh, the guy in the wheelchair and the guy in England that's really... Hawkins. <laughs> Stephen yeah, Hawkins, Hawking, yeah Stephen Hitchens. Hawking. And um, anyways, they're, they're all believe in monism too. They agree with... Parmenides, his his philosophy has lasted over two thousand years. So, like I was reading Justin Martyr the other day, and he was, you know, he said um, he was talking about philosophy, and he and the importance of philosophy and good philosophy. And he said Moses was around and wrote before the Greeks wrote. Moses came first. Greek philosophy came second. And Moses said, "Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one." And that's what simplicity means, that God is one. He's indivisible. So, and I guess if you're going to say you don't believe in divine simplicity, that God is one, then what is it that you do believe in? If you don't believe that God is one, then what do you believe? If You know, that's what I think is the, the what people hear when they say, when you say that divine simplicity isn't true, is that you're saying that God isn't one. So um, so let me get to your question. So again, here's how I understand it. So you have Parmenides comes first. Plato tries to solve Parmenides' conundrum because they all believe in the Greek gods by by what he does in the, in the Republic with the forms. And so you have all of these different forms. So like if you drive a Ford back and forth to work and you see a Tesla go by, you don't look at that and go, I don't know what that is. You're like, I'm driving the form of a car and that Tesla went by. It's in the form of a car. So that's just Western thought. We kind of think in that way, but nobody talks about the forms and the movers, like, like what Plato was trying to do. Um, so Geisler talks about that in his systematic theology, how Plato couldn't defeat Parmenides' argument. Socrates tried to do it by negation. The wall is not the floor. The floor is not the ceiling. Um, but you still have being and non-being. The, the wall has being. The floor has being. The ceiling has being. The tree has being. And there's only being and non-being, which is what Parmenides was saying. So Augustine was very heavy into... Greek philosophy, as you've said, he taught it. He taught rhetoric. So when when he became a Christian, my understanding, his view of divine simplicity, and let me read this from, this is uh, the Evangelical Dictionary Theology. I don't know. I can tell you who wrote this particular one. Uh, this is D.B. Fletcher, whoever that is. So this is uh, the entry for voluntarism. Stemming from the Latin word voluntas, meaning will, voluntarism is a general name for a variety of philosophical positions united and their emphasis on will. So when you read what Augustine did, is everything that you're saying about divine simplicity that you don't like, I'm like, that's what Augustine taught. He taught that God 
was a was a static will. So you hear, you know, you, you listen to Tim Stratton talk about Molinism. What does he say? God and eternity past, you know, shuffled or sorted between what could be and what, you know, what will be, what would be. And then he decreed and predestined everything that would take place in eternity past. With Calvinists, they're like, well, we don't need middle knowledge. God just decrees and ordains everything because he's a will and they conceive of him as a will. So when you read Calvin, God has a secret will. He has an ordaining will. He has a decreeing will. He has a revealed will. He has a secret will. You read Augustine, he has a will of permission. You read Arminius, he has a will of permission. And, um, you know, Molina was an Augustinian. So he had the same view of God that Augustine, that's, that's a Neoplatonist view of God that you conceive of God as a form of will. That's what voluntarism is. So like if you read, you know, Geisler's book on um, on Calvinism, the one that he wrote, Chosen by God, that's he points out that John Piper is arguing for voluntarism. He has like a couple paragraphs on that. Um, in his systematic theology, he talks about, um, uh, who's the guy that's at Calvin now? Um, he was at Notre Dame. Um, boy, he's a big philosopher. I always forget his name, but he points out that he's a Platonist too. Um, I could find the quote and read it for you, but but yeah, so they're they're viewing God as a will. So when you look in like in Calvin's book on the eternal predestination of God, he says God is a simple will. So he's not he's not saying that. His, his view of divine simplicity is that God is to be conceived of as a form of will, and God's will is simple, and he's static, like what you're saying. Everything was decreed from eternity past. He's not going to change his mind. He decreed it, <laughs> you know, before he made everything. That's how it's going to be. So everything so I think that, you you're, were, that you're, you're right. trying to highlight the difference between Augustine's Neoplatonism and Aquinas's. Right. So Aquinas, right. right. So I get, what I'm saying is I'm agreeing when you guys criticize divine simplicity and you say, here's what divine simplicity entails. I'm like, that's Augustine's divine simplicity. So when Aquinas came along, you know, 800 years after Augustine, Avicenna and Islam had been had co-opted Aristotle. So if you wanted to use Aristotle, the church would not let you do it because Aristotle was Muslim. They, that's what they, they figured, that Aristotle was the Greek philosophy of Islam, and Augustine was a doctor of the church. And that Augustine was using Greek philosophy and was a Neoplatonist isn't explicit. You have to you have to read the Republic and, you know, go through all of these hoops to see. It is explicit. He, he tells us. Okay. Augustine so tells explicit. us. Okay. So yeah. We'll, we'll pull up those quotes. Okay. So it's explicit then. I, you know, I I didn't think it was that explicit, but I'm not going to say that it wasn't. I He was a Neoplatonist. Um, like you can read um, what's the Stanford.plato.edu. Look up Augustine. It'll say he was a Platonist. Go to New Advent, which is the Roman Catholic site. They'll tell you Augustine was a Platonist. He used Platonist. You know, so, so what's the difference says, between God being open and right. the future being open? <laughs> no. So, so because of so what Augustine, what with their view of God as a static will, when God decrees everything that's going to happen, and this is what James White says in the Potter's Freedom, that. Foreknowledge um, is that that de, uh, predestination is independent of foreknowledge. It's not according to foreknowledge. James White in his book says it's independent of foreknowledge because as God decreed it in eternity past, God knew it was going to happen. 
that's how they view God. God's sovereign, by God's sovereign will, he ordained everything that would come to pass. And of course, simultaneously with God ordaining what was going to come to pass, he knew what was going to come to pass. So, it, so predestination is independent of foreknowledge. He doesn't look through the halls of time and see the choices people are going to make and, you know, change things. It, you know, it, it's what you're saying. It's very static. And um, so you're viewing God as, as a form of will. So when Augustine or when Aquinas came along 800 years later and he read Aristotle and he's like, Augustine is wrong. You can't say that Augustine is wrong when you're a Roman Catholic because Augustine is a doctor of the church. You're saying that the Roman Catholic Church is not the church that was founded by Jesus Christ if Augustine is wrong. That's how they view it. Um, I had an interaction with Matt Frad the other day. <laughs> I can, 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 can we bring us back around yeah, on yeah, track? Sorry. Okay, so yeah. So if so in the in Augustine's view, foreknowledge imposes necessity. If God knows something is going to happen, it must, it takes place necessarily. So what my understanding is that Richard Rice was his um, his objection was to was to do the same thing that Calvinists do is they say that God is sovereign over his attributes. So God is he has love and he has hate and he's sovereign over his love and he's sovereign over his hate. He can love some people and hate other people because he's sovereign, so he can do either one. So Richard Rice is like, well, if he's sovereign over his attribute of love, then he can be sovereign over his attribute of, of omniscience, and he can choose not to know things. Because if God okay. foreknows something, it imposes necessity on it, which is Augustine. All right, so, so the, right. Our, our subject topic is, is Christianity influenced by Platonism? So can you draw right. that so, to Platonic influence? Right. So if you're, a, if you're a Calvinist, if you're an Arminian, if you're a Molinist, um, those are all Platonists because you're viewing God as a form of will. If you're an Arminian, God has a will of permission. If you're an Augustinian, like um, when William Lane Craig and Bishop Barron were talking about the problem of evil, Bishop Barron, they're both saying God has a will of permission because Molina was an Augustinian. He was a Jesuit and they're an Augustinian order in the Roman Catholic Church. And they, Augustine is a doctor of the church. They follow Augustine. So God has a will of permission. They're conceiving of God as a form of will, which comes from Plato's Republic, which is where Augustine got it from. Because like I said, you're driving a car, you are in the form of a car, <laughs> you know, you see a different brand or different color or whatever. And you're like, well, that's just another form of a car. You're sitting in a, in a chair that's like covered in upholstery. And there's another chair that's just made out of wood. It's still a form of a chair. So you, you view God as a will. That's voluntarism. You view God as a form of a will. And that's, Calvin, that's Luther, that's that's Molina. So what Protestant isn't influenced by those three things? And that comes from Plato's Republic. So any any Protestant version of Christianity is Platonist. It's Neoplatonist because Augustine got it from Plato's Republic. And most Roman Catholics are also Neoplatonists because even if they're in a Dominican order, they're still 20% Augustinian because Augustine's a doctor of the church and they won't say that he's wrong. Okay, so I am going to go ahead and bring us back to yeah. Plato and, and talk a little bit about the one in Plato. Uh, we, we kind of showed a, a, a little screenshot of Norman Geisler talking about pure actuality, God's aseity. Uh, li listen to this. This is Plato. If one were moved, it would be either moved in place or changed in nature, for these are the only kinds of motion. And the one, when it changes and ceases to be itself, cannot be any longer one. It cannot, therefore, experience the sort of motion which is change of nature. So that goes on and on and on like this. That change is decay. Change means you're not the same thing anymore. 
Um, it, it's all about if you have potentiality, if you have potential to change, you can't be one. So we'll turn to Norman Geisler. And you've quoted, Jordan's quoted, Norm, not quoted, uh, he's referenced Geisler's work, uh, several of his books, in which Norman Geisler talks about very similar concepts. And I got pulled up on the screen, his anti-open theist book, uh, God Made in the Image of Man. And he's talking about God's aseity, self-existent. He says, God is pure actuality. You know, what this means is there's no, no potentiality in his being whatsoever. God has no potential to be other than what he is. There's no yeah. possible change within God. There's there's no relationship. So relationship causes change. So if even if God is static and we're moving in relation to him, just because that there's there's those lines of intersection, those lines of dependency, those lines of 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 uh, motion or lines of some sort of interdependency, it, that those types of things can't exist. God has to exist on a different realm other than that, in which he has no relation to anything outside himself. He's pure actuality with no potentiality in his being whatsoever. This is Norman Geisler. He says, <clears throat> that is, God has no possibility of not existing. Whatever has potentiality, potency, needs to be actualized or affected by another. And since God is the ultimate cause, there is nothing beyond him to actualize any potential he may have. Nor can God actualize his own potential to exist, since this would mean he caused his own existence. So God, God has to be this pure actuality, part of his property of being the ultimate cause of all things. Nothing can act on God. God is his own action and can't even act on himself. God can't, as Will Duffy says in the Matt Slick debate, decide to add one more raindrop to one storm in the future. God can't do that because that's potentiality. God is pure act. God is pure actualization. God can't be other than whatever he is. Does that make sense, Drew? Yeah, it may, I mean, it makes sense to say that God can't be other than what he is. I mean, that feels like a rather banal, you know, just, okay, sure. Um, I guess, <clears throat> it's because in my mind, the biblical data is always running in the back of my mind, right? So when he says, um, I think you said, actualize any potential he may have when it comes to something like uh, impassibility, for instance. If God is provoked to anger, then then that is happening from his creatures to him in a way that just seems obvious an obvious denial of impassibility. So I I guess what I'm saying is I get I get the like simple God God can't be other than what he is. He just is. But then there's kind of all these on flow entailments that I'm just like Okay. Yeah, so like if God gets angry, that's a change in state. That means that original state wasn't the ultimate being. That wasn't God. And because God got angry, he is not what he is. The substance of God is not God because it changes from what it was to what it is. I don't, under, I don't understand how people are uh, conflating God's substance and the nature of who he is with emotions <laughs> because, like <laughs> like i i become a different person when i get angry like my substance changes i just yes because it's even... it's a it's a change it, it it's it's some other it's an accidental property and so when we talk about accidental properties these are things that don't have to be attached to whatever object like uh oh got a gray cat gray is an accidental property it could be a black cat it could be a white cat it doesn't have to exist and so now you're ascribing accidental properties to god that don't actually have to be part of who god is Th those are changes those those are outside influences those are things on top of who god is that's complicating the substance he's no longer simple anymore if he has these distinct um discursive type of properties, these disc discrete properties, these properties that can be separated from God that are attached to God that they can't be integrated into the God substance that's changed in the God substance. So this is a mentality. Platonism is a metaphysical system. And that's what we need to keep in mind. It's not a biblical system. It's not the biblical system that Christine Hayes professor was talking about. This is a Platonistic metaphysical system that God must fit into. And so this, this is where we see 
the Hellenization of Christianity, these two systems, the Semitic idea of God versus the Platonistic idea of God. The Platonistic idea of God is a metaphysical model. You're looking for metaphysical truths. You're looking for metaphysical formulas. You're applying those metaphysical formulas to God and coming up with God properties because of these metaphysics. You don't find those metaphysics in the Bible. You don't find discussions of metaphysical properties of God, what God must be to be God, what, what the God substance is. Uh, we don't talk about uh, change and becoming within the Bible. These are not Semitic concerns. They, they don't care about these things in the Bible. To them, God is purely and simply relational. God, God is a person. He's an actor. You can interact with him. You pray to him. Your idea is to live in conjunction with him, in harmony with him, to create a, a, a better life here and now. It's not talk about the God substance, the God model. And so this, this, is, this is my big emphasis, is you're looking at a metaphysical system versus a personal and relational God. That's where the Platonization of Christianity, that, that, that's, that's what it injected into the system. You got Augustine, and let's pull him up. He says, having read the books of the Platonists, I was taught, so he has, he has a bunch of different quotes. One of them is he, he thought the Bible was absurd until he read it in light of Platonism, until Ambrose told him that you don't look at the actual words you just have to read above the words. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. You can't read what the Bible actually says because it's absurd. And so you instead, uh, Ambrose uh, and Simplicinus, they praise Augustine for coming across the books of the Platonists, which they say gives truth. And he says that, here, here's what Augustine says in his confessions. He's confessing this. Having read those books of the Platonists and hence being taught to search for incorporeal truth, and so this is the idea of Platonism. God is incorporeal. God is a other substance. God's not part of the universe, which is something that he had not encountered until his 30s. He has lived his whole life in a Christian world uh, thinking God is corporeal or part of the universe. It's Platonism that teaches him this other mode of thinking, this, this, this realm of metaphysics. He says, I saw thy invisible things, understood by those things which are made, and though cast back are perceived, what that was, uh, though the darkness of mind was not was hindered from contemplating. I'm going to kind of scroll forward. Basically, he says he could have been, he had all his theology that he has now, just reading the Platonists. The one thing that Christianity gave him was charity, what was Jesus Christ. I, he, it's Platonism plus Jesus Christ. And his friends write this to him. They say, hey, Augustine, your, your letters are full of Plato, Plotinus, and Jesus. This is what they're praising him. It's, it's not a criticism. They love him for it because Plato was in vogue. This, this is a high praise. He says, um, for when I had first been formed in thy holy scriptures, he started off a Christian and had fought and hadst thou in familiar use of them grown sweet unto me. And had then I fallen upon those other volumes, they might perhaps have withdrawn me from the solid ground of piety. He was never like a full Christian. So he's saying, if I was, if I started as a Christian, they came across the books of the Platonists. I would have became a Platonist. But luckily, I came across the Platonist books first and then came across the books of the Bible because guess what that gives me? It gives me Platonism plus Jesus. He says, they might perhaps have withdrawn me from the solid ground of piety or had I continued in that healthful frame, which I had hence imbibed, I might have thought it might have been obtained by the study of those books alone. Uh, uh I don't got the rest of it highlighted, but basically he says that everything he learned about metaphysics, he learned from the Plainists. He, he, he's open about this. He's, he's honest about this. He's telling us where he's getting these things. And I guess that's where, you know, we, some Christians might read something like, I think it's Malachi 3 verse 10, and then they think that's a metaphysical truth. Whereas really it's grounded in the historical narrative of the Bible where God is saying, he's not saying I am a metaphysical reality that is pure actuality with no potentiality and will not change because if I change, then you wouldn't be able to trust me. If there's one rogue molecule, then you can't trust any of my promises and so on and so forth. But, um, so I guess if you're looking for sort of metaphysical truths and that's what you're going to find, 
but it seems when you back away and sort of look at look at the context it's not yeah it's not drawing out this um i guess just these platonistic ideals or whatever have you yeah so uh, here here are the claims um from critics of the hellenization hypothesis and uh they're summed up i got this book called god in motion now there's not really a good digital copy so it's hard to show on the screen i don't want to pay 60 bucks for the digital copy and so basically i'll have to summarize from memory his points basically his biggest point is hellenization was a long process and it started early and um and hellenization is a good thing remember our our platonist friend in the beginning he said I'm a Platonist, and uh, your criticism of Christianity being uh, Hellenized, Platonized, uh, is dependent on if you see it as a good or bad thing. This book basically says that it's not so much that Christianity was Platonized, but uh, Platonism was Christianized, something like that. And that's kind of like his his big talking point. It's like I I don't know if that's better. I don't I don't think that the salvation that you're looking for. I think it's pretty obvious when we just look at the data. And we we did we looked at one data point. Um, also, I I would suggest the book the Neoplatonists of Alexandria, which talk about individuals like Clement of Alexandria and Origen of Alexandria. They're all from Alexandria. Coincidentally, uh, Astrolabus, one of the translators before Jesus of the LXX, was also in Alexandria. And his big thing was we need to de-anthropomorphize the Bible. If it talks about God coming down from heaven, that's not what it actually means. There, there's no coming down. Uh, that's just anthropomorphic. They, they, they don't call it anthropomorphic because when they use the term anthropomorphic, they're talking about people who actually believe God has a body. But they'll say, oh, that, that spiritually means something else. Philo of Alexandria picks up on this theme. And uh, no more in the Bible, like it says, God repents in Genesis 6. He says, whoever actually believes that, those people are idiots. That's his claim, Philo of Alexandria. Yeah, Clement picks this up, Clement of Alexandria, origin of Alexandria, uh, who was also taught by Ammonius Sactus, who was the teacher of Plotinus. And, and then both Origen and Plotinus are heavy influences on Augustine in his works. And so you you, you see this uh, permeating throughout. You have the Simplicanus, Simplicanus who is a translator of, of the the. Uh, Plotinus, and you have Ambrose uh, endorsing Platonistic beliefs in his sermons directly to Augustine and uh, commending him for these studies. The, the whole world's Hellenized. They're incorporating these Platonistic values. You, you could just see it if by just reading the data that's available. So re recently, maybe this is a little, um, uh, this is not I mean, it's on topic, but it's not on topic of what you were just saying. But I have a question regarding, I'll, I'll probably have to scoot off here soon, but maybe as one of my last questions. So uh, a friend of the podcast, member of the network, Warren McGrew, recently got a little bit of pushback, shall we say, from equating Neoplatonism to classical theism. So I'm just wondering if we were to kind of steel man... Um, what somebody would respond to all of this and saying, no, 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 uh, classical theism isn't a Neoplatonism, it's different. What would they say to that? Or what have you kind of heard people say that are of that variety? And then how would you respond to that? Do you have any thoughts on that? They don't know their own metaphysics. <laughs> uh, yeah, so they should read James Dwezel and then get back to us and then tell us that their philosophy is not Neoplatonism. That, that, it, it, literally, they don't know. They don't understand divine simplicity. So divine every ability. So every classical theist, you would say, is a Neoplatonist. It's the same conception of God. God as concept. God as pure simplicity. God as pure actuality. The, those are the defining characteristics. A change equals degradation. So when you hear people talking about divine immutability, now I'm not talking about like a soft immutability where it's like God's character doesn't change. No, they believe that any change within God, no matter how small, uh, turns him not into God anymore. 
that that's what these people believe divine yeah, I don't ability un- i don't understand that i don't understand that <laughs> It's just, I mean, I guess obviously, you know, we, we sort of alluded, I think in this, or maybe it wasn't in this podcast, but you talk about presuppositional apologetics. It just seems like a, a presupposition that people have. And then there are all these things that follow on from it. Like what you just said of like, if God is provoked to anger, you know, essentially that there's suddenly he's becoming a different being. And I just don't understand that thinking I guess, okay. because I just don't carry the same presuppositions. But. So, so I, I guess a good test for these people who claim that classical theism is different than Platonism. Just ask them to define divine simplicity and define what it means to be pure actuality and see if you get a blank stare back or see if you get an actual answer back that's actually resembling what Norman Geisler has on the screen. Norman Geisler writes, (laughs) since God is not composed in his being, but is pure existence or pure actuality with no potentiality, follows he is simple and indivisible. A being that by nature is not composed cannot decompose. One that has no parts cannot be torn apart. Hence, God is absolute absolute simplicity with no possibility of being divided. He is literally indivisible. He cannot be divisible because uh, then he would have the potentiality to be divided. But pure actually has no potentiality in its being whatsoever. So yeah, if you have parts, even if you're not divided, you have the potential to be divided. And God is pure actuality. He doesn't have that potentiality. God is pure simplicity. So unless unless these people are coming back and able to just explain their basic metaphysics that their system affirms, they're not serious actors. They're not serious scholars. Um, they're repeating lines that someone has fed them. That, that, that's really, literally what's happening. This is what I don't understand. Okay. So, uh, I, you know, I don't have any issue with saying that God is indivisible, that he doesn't have parts and stuff like that. But I don't understand why me saying that entails God as pure actuality with no potentiality. Not to mention, and maybe this is a little bit of a rhetorical point. I don't know if maybe this is a subtle equivocation on my part. But if God is pure actuality with no potentiality, doesn't that make him impotent? Like, yes, yes, it does make him impotent. He can't do things, but they won't say that. So he's, he's omnipotent in that he is actualizing everything and all things all at once that he is doing, but he's also impotent in that he cannot add to that, I guess. He's a cog in the system. He, he must do those things. He doesn't have the potentiality to do otherwise. But just it's if you're using the language of their system, that they're going to automatically assume that you're actually speaking towards their system. And so it'd be like if you're in a conversation with a Calvinist and you use the word sovereignty, um, they have an idiosyncratic definition of sovereignty that's not in any dictionary anywhere on earth that's ever been used. They have their own definition in their own system, in their own worldview. If you say God is perfect, what they don't they don't mean what normal people mean by saying God is perfect. What they mean is that he's we have this metaphysical value system under which God reaches the maximal value point uh, and can't change from that maximal value. If we say God's perfect, you know, you might say, Hey, I got the perfect baby over here. Or you might say, Hey, God is perfect because he, he's sinless or something like that. Oh, Jesus lived, lived a perfect life. That's not what they're talking about. Uh, you're, if you're, if you're using their language, you have to make sure that you're clearly not, they're, they're under uh, no false assumptions and they they'll do it they'll just try to pretend that if you use language that their system uses that you're just adopting all their categories and they'll like for example when i was getting kicked out of duluth bible church and they're like oh this guy won't even say god is perfect yeah it's it's your loaded presuppositions of your metaphysics it's 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 platonistic categories it's categorically incorrect the way you're using the language nor, yes, you could say God is perfect using normal dictionary language, but that's not what you people mean when you use the word. You don't use the dictionary. You use your own crazy metaphysics that that's just whatever you want to define it as. And if we use your language, then apparently we're, we're affirming the truth of your system. So, right. yeah, that's it's why like, it's like you just said, if I say if I say God is sovereign then that means to some people that God has immutably predetermined everything. And if there's one rogue molecule, then we just can't trust God at all. 
<laughs> Whereas maybe so, I just mean God is king and he can do what he wants to do. Yeah. So you're a normal person. You have normal thoughts. And so you say, hey, yeah, God, <laughs> God can't be divided. Yeah, that makes sense. God can't be not God. Okay, sure. That makes sense. And then, then you walk on like normal. They, they're just not using the terms. They're categorically in a different world than us when they're so interacting. Kind of, so kind of going back to the, the question that I asked, you would say, well, yeah, sure. The normie Christian can kind of get behind these ideas of God not changing, God not dividing and stuff like that. But when you say that, you're meaning something really kind of, you know, more vanilla and general and intuitive versus what they're hearing or what they might mean when they say that entails all these other different things because it's a metaphysical system that comes along with it. And it's a purposeful bait and switch. It's, it's a rhetorical device they use to try to get people on board with them and demonize their opposition. Uh, they know what they're doing. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it's fundamentally dishonest. Uh, so one thing I like to do in open theist debates is I like to point out what um, classical omniscience actually entails. God has ungenerated, innate, non-discursive, uh, eternal, unfalsifiable, exhaustive knowledge of all things past, present, and future, all in one simple truth. It's, it's, it's not divisible. God doesn't have individual propositional truths in his mind, because guess what? If God had individual propositional truths in his mind, that's parts. God's knowledge is a, a, a one simple set of knowledge that's identical to everything else within God. God's knowledge is not different than God's power. God's power is not different than God's eternity. God's eternity is not different than God's substance. It's all the same one substance without parts. This is what they mean when they're using this language. And so normal Christians like, oh yeah, God's omniscient. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. That's, that's not how the term is being used and meant. It's a bait and switch. Jordan, you got some thoughts over there? You look like you might be uh, <laughs> flipping through some pages and different stuff. Yeah. So uh, I've read a lot of Geisler. I've, you know, he has a four volume systematic theology. I read every one cover to cover and, you know, I've gone through them and highlighted and read some of his other books. I've never found where he disagrees with Augustine. And what you're reading there is like a hybrid. His, because he's saying there's no potentiality in God. That's not what Aquinas would say. So the, it's a different, it, it's different between the two. Um, so what, what Geisler is saying there that you're disagreeing with, again, I would disagree with that. I have the, you know, some of the same criticisms, but Drew, what you were asking about is, uh, you know, like, what do they mean when they say God is perfect? They, they look at Romans and it says God has a perfect will. So God, God's will is perfect and everything happens according to the will of God. Augustine said everything happens as God wills it. Calvin says I can't nothing imagine can happen the contrary of, uh, to God's will. So God's will is perfect. So when God wills evil, it's good that evil happens. Because God is perfect. So so what would you say about this Aquinas quote? First, because what is shown above is there is some first being who we call God, that this first being must be pure act without admixture of any potentiality, for the reason that absolutely potentiality is posterior to act. Now everything that which is any way changed is in some way in potentiality. Hence it is evident that it is impossible for God to be any way changeable. So here it sounds like Aquinas is denying potentiality in God. Right. So <clears throat> the the first way that so there's the five ways to prove the existence of God. And the first way, very briefly, in Romans. Paul says that you can look at nature and see God's attributes. So for Aquinas, it goes physics, metaphysics, ontology, and then epistemology. So what Aquinas says is you look around you and you see motion. And the way Avicenna did it is we think we think log we think uh, sequentially. So what Avicenna said, you know, that's the Kalam. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. So you're like, well, 
I'm here. So I had a parent and they had a parent and they had a, you know, so you think back linearly, you're thinking back in time. When did things start? But that's not what Aquinas, that's not his argument. His argument is that he thinks hierarchically. So instead of left to right, he's thinking up and down. He's got, he says that right now, something that because you see something in motion, something else had to move you from potentiality to act. So what gave you the power to, to actualize your potentiality? So, you know, like, while well, there's air around me, I'm breathing the air, you know? So he says, trace that back. What, what gives the air? What, you know? So he just says, hierarchically, when you get back to, there must be something that doesn't, that isn't being moved from potentiality to act. And that is God. So when it How says is that, that God different from what Augustine believes is, I guess, is the main question, right? Like, because it sounds right. like so Aquinas with... is just echoing Augustine. Well, no, because Augustine is conceiving of God as a form of will. And Aquinas is conceiving of God as an essence. So Augustine says that God is incomprehensible. His will is incomprehensible. And some of his attributes are incomprehensible. So you have univocal, equivocal, and uh, equivocal predication, the attributes of God. So some people do univocal predication. Um, Aquinas does analogical predication of all of the attributes. Um, Calvinists, some attributes are analogically predicated and other anim other attributes are equivocally predicated because when God wills evil and we evil's good, then what is good for God must be completely different than what is good for you and me. So if you read the French confession or if you read Augustine's uh, in Chiridion, they both say that it is that what is good for God, his goodness is incomprehensible. And the laws of logic do not apply to God's goodness because if God wills evil and what God wills is good, then evil is good. Therefore, logic cannot apply to God in the area of what is goodness. So the main difference between Aquinas and Aristotle's view is that, Arist uh, sorry, uh, Augustine's view is that Augustine believed that God was pure will and Aquinas yes. believed that it God was hierarchical. Is... No, that's how he... He's using a hierarchical thing for that for something to be in motion, right? For for my glasses to move across the screen, I had to act on these glasses and move them from potency to act. What moved me from potency to act? What moved that thing from potency to act? So he's so that saying that God, right, right now, right now, God is the thing that is in act, that supplies, that moves the universe from potency to act at all times. So it's hierarchical. It's not that you're reasoning backward because then God could just wind it up and walk away. And God doesn't do that. It so, says in the Bible that God is upholding the universe. So it seems to me like uh, Aquinas and Augustine's view are... Um, foundationally the same, but uh, structurally different is what it sounds like you're saying, if well, I'm trying to understand you. Right. So when you come along 800 years after Augustine and you're in the Roman Catholic Church and you can't contradict the teaching magisterium, which is infallible, and you can't contradict the Pope when he speaks ex cathedra, and Augustine is a doctor of the church, you have so to are you use, saying that Thomas Aquinas agrees with Augustine? You have to use the same words and redefine them. So while Augustine said that God was incomprehensible in his attributes, Aquinas said God's attributes can be all be understood by analogy, but God is incomprehensible in his essence. 
So God is incomprehensible in his essence. So it, it he's using the same words, but he's he's saying very different things. And, you know, I don't know what else to say. He had to do it. And, you know, this book by Chesterton on Aquinas is really good. This really helped me understand guess, the difference between the two. I guess what you're saying in summary is that at first glance, Aquinas seems lockstep with Augustine in yes. his version of divine simplicity. But if you read how he elaborates on those things, it changes. Yes. So, so Aquinas would say there's no passive potency in God. Augustine says that there's no passion in God. So it's like what you guys are saying, you know, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated. It doesn't matter what you do in this life. You're not going to make God jealous. You're not going to make God angry. He's already willed all of that from eternity past because you're not going to move him to that because he was already in that state because he willed it from eternity past. God is eternally angry and eternally joyous. Because hate like is one of his so attributes. So many problems. <laughs> right. Because hate is one of his attributes. And that's, so that's how Augustine's version of divine simplicity is picked on. How, I mean, even, even James White figures this out, that how can God be both love and hate at the same time? If Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated, and God is both love and hate at the same time and in the same sense, then you have, that's logically contradictory. That's why he denies, he denies it. And he's denying Augustine's version of divine simplicity. And he's All right to do so. <laughs> so, so if you, if you go to my webpage, uh, God is open. Yeah. I, I do have this subsection that church father quotes and, uh, yeah. There's a bunch of different sections about a bunch of different of these omni and m attributes. And Augustine does affirm divine ineffability, which is one of those attributes that most Christians, they don't understand. They've never heard of. They've never heard it defined. But it's in almost every systematic theology, there's going to be this idea that God is incomprehensible. You can't understand God because guess what? Understanding God means there's predicates of God. That means there's well, distinctions in God. That means there, there's parts. It, it, God's not simple anymore. Well, yeah. in, ineffable and incomprehensible are two different things. Yeah. Uh, again, I think you make distinctions that aren't actual real distinctions. And so you, you'd have to like show how those people are using them uh, nuanced in different ways for me to accept that those, those nuanced differences do exist. Does that make sense? Yeah, well, I mean, in Prima Pars, Aquinas says God is incomprehensible in his essence. In, in Chiridion, Augustine says God is incomprehensible, has incomprehensible goodness. Yep, yep. They're in, talking about the same thing. And I'm and he's well, talking about it about here. The attribute and the others about the essence. And when Aquinas so talks says about you. the attribute. That's that's something you're saying. Well, I can read you the quotes. Oh, if they use different words, that means they're talking about different concepts. Yeah, you, well, you have using, to. They're both saying incomprehensible. Augustine is, is describing an attribute of God, goodness, omni, right. omnibenevolence. And he says God's omnibenevolence is incomprehensible. You'll have to show me where Aquinas denies Augustine's understanding of ineffability or vice versa. Well, I don't think it exists. Ineffable is not the same as incomprehensible. That, again, that's your claim. Well, I, you haven't shown this claim. It, and guys, <laughs> well, when Aquinas talks about how the attributes of gods are predicated between univocal, analogical, and equivocal, he says that what is love for God can be understood by analogy. So when you read the parable of the prodigal son and you know, the son goes away and, and the father still loves him. He comes back. He's loved unconditionally. What Aquinas would say is that the love God has for, for us, his creatures, is like the love that a father has for his son. But it is ineffable because it is perfect and it's not, you, it's not something that you and I can fully express. 
That's what ineffable means. Okay. Does does he say being fully expressed? Does Incomprehensible he th means that you are unable to understand it. Does he say Augustine had this other idea which I reject? Uh, there like are that. places where Aquinas does say he doesn't right. say again. When you're in the Roman Catholic Church, you can't do that. He's but instead of using Augustine's name, he says people that say that everything happens according to God's simple will are an error. You can read where Augustine says that. Okay, well, we I got it. Augustine pulled up about ineffability, his conception of how we can conceive of God if we can. It's basically Neoplatonist idea. So Plotinus has a very famous quote in which once you utter the one or the good, offer no further thought because we can't actually speak about God. Augustine parrots this idea. He talks about it. Uh, you can't speak of God in any positive way. Give any God any predicates. Predicates create parts. And that's this idea. He says, uh, he, uh, have I uttered anything about God? No, I, I say no. How do I know this? Except for the fact God is unspeakable. What have I said? Has it been unspeakable? Could not have been spoken? And so God is not even be called unspeakable because to say this even is to speak of him. Thus, there arises a curious contradiction of words, because if the unspeakable is what cannot be spoken of, and it's unspeakable, then it cannot be unspeakable. And this opposition of words is rather to be avoided by silence than to be explained away by speech. And yet God, although nothing worthy of his greatness can be said of him, has constantly descended to accept the worship of men's mouths, and it has desired us, through the medium of our own words, to rejoice in his praise. Again, this is, this is basically straight from Plotinus, who talks about we can't say anything positive about God. And the reason goes back to simplicity. If you add predicates to God, God is no longer simple. And so ineffability in this sense means we can't have positive thoughts. We can't have predicates that actually apply to God. Everything that we say of God is condescension. It's, it's language for our understanding, but it's not actually applicable to God as God exists, if that makes sense. It says, for the sound of those two syllables itself conveys no true knowledge of his nature. But yet all who know Latin tongue are led when in sound reaches the ears to think of the nature supreme and excellence and eternal existence. We can't speak positively like a, about God. Is there like a paragraph heading that he's saying ineffable? Because I know he says incomprehensible. And this sounds is, more like incomprehensible than ineffable. Well, he's saying he's saying he's talking about ineffability because he's talking about you can't speak anything about God. And even when you say you can't speak anything about God, you're speaking something about God, which is speaking about God and curious contradiction and so on. But here's my hot take, and then I have to go. I started this a second ago, but my mic yeah. is on mute. And maybe this is more for our audience because maybe uh, our network and a lot of people here will will agree. But like, it, if you agree with this quote from Augustine. You just can't, you might as well just get rid of your Bible. Like you can't, you fundamentally cannot be a Christian because the Bible is full of predicates that describe God. Like it's literally telling you, this is what God is like, and this is what he does. And this is, I, and I know that there's the rejoinder of like, well, it's condescension language and stuff like that. But like, I, I know that Augustine's smart. I know he's prolific. May, you know, I haven't read heaps of it. Maybe he has some nice things to say, but this just seems. You're not missing like, much. Why do people take him seriously? Because, <laughs> this is because just... he's a doctor of the church in the Roman Catholic Church. That's why they take him seriously. It, I mean, it's hilarious to listen to Roman Catholics, you know, talk about Augustine. And it's funny, too, when, you know, Anselm just rips on Augustine's view of the atonement. And when you listen to Roman Catholics talk about the atonement, they're like, oh, Anselm and Augustine were in full agreement on the atonement. And I'm like, are you reading him? Are you reading the words on the page? Th these are not people that agreed. <laughs> it's, it's bizarre. I think we've demonstrated pretty thoroughly that, number one, um, it's a scholarly accepted position that Christianity has been Platonized. Uh, number two, they hold a lot, Christianity and Platonism, hold a lot of the same views and the same concepts. And three, that we have historical figures like Augustine just saying, hey, I read Platonism and I interpreted Christianity in light of Platonism. And so you, you got smoking guns as well. So <laughs> we got a lot of elements that lead us to believe 
Christianity is Hellenized, they were proud of it. They were proud of incorporating Plato into their works. Augustine, your, your works are full of Plato, Plotinus, and Jesus. I guess it's like, oh, yeah, thanks, yeah. Well, it's like they, Dave they Hunt. It. He said uh, he's a good Neoplatonist, right? I mean, like and he is. Seen, and I'm yeah. I'm happy he's honest. <laughs> he's he's honest. It, 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 it's hard to find honest people. Yeah, here's here's what Paul says in Romans: For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. Clearly seen and understood, but also that, incomprehensible. That's a good point, Jordan. Paul's not right. a Platonist. That's a really good point. He doesn't. He doesn't right. accept that category. He's not an not an Augustinian and not a Calvinist. <laughs> that, that's a really good point. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for pointing that out. I'll have to add that to my list of reasons Paul's not a Platonist. Yeah. He, he, he thinks the Holy Spirit searches us and then tells God about us. But what we need before we pray for it, the Holy Spirit communicates to God. That's that's his conception. Uh, yeah. But all right. So we'll end there. I thank Jordan and Drew for joining us. Oh, Drew's our host. So I'll let you outro us. I'm stealing it yeah, from you. I, I'm everyone, thieving. go to the website, bstheology.com. I don't even know what we have out there. We got a few episodes. Click the like button. That helps us out. And go check out our other channels. Not a tame sheep. God is open. We and the provisionist perspective. Uh, just hit the rewind button, Jacob. Uh, we'll talk to you later. May God bless you all so that you can be See a blessing guys. to everyone around you. <laughs>